So I went from a Friday, my last day working for the U.S. Congress was on a Friday. On Sunday, it wasn't even Monday, two days later, I was in I was in Indiana on Oprah's farm as her new producer. That was quite a switch, left brain, right brain. I don't know many people who would go from a Friday to a Sunday from a lawyer for the U.S. Congress to a producer on the Oprah Winfrey Show. To me, it was a matter of finding people who were likable. So just as I found people who were likable working for Chuck, with Oprah, I took notice of who were, were likable witnesses. It turned out to be the same categories of likability, the same traits. I whittled them down to eight traits over the years with different sub-traits. And as early as then, 1994, I said, you know, this would be a good book someday. And lo and behold, from 1994 till late last year, I had thought of writing a book. So the book really was in the works for 25 years. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Stephen, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Fantastic to be here, Srini. Well, I am so thrilled to have you here. As I was saying before we hit record, uh, I found your book, The Turn On, How the Powerful Make Us Like Them from Washington to Wall Street to Hollywood. And I thought to myself, this is a book that's far more than just about likability. It's about the psychology of building an audience for anything, whether it's you want to be a blogger, podcast, or whatever it is. So I thought, you know, this is relevant to creative work. But before we get into all of that, um, given your background, I want to start by asking what I think is a very relevant question and one of my favorites, and that is what social group were you a part of in high school? And what impact did that end up having on the choices that you've made with your life and your career? Well, Srini, I was a deeply unpopular guy who was elected student body president. Okay. <laughs> and let me explain um, the paradox there. Um, I, I have been political my whole life uh, since I was age six. Um, I'm now 58 years old. I was born in 1962. And at age six, I played hooky from school to campaign for Hubert Humphrey. And my mother found me at the 1968 Hubert Humphrey for President Democratic Headquarters in Queens, New York, where I grew up. She got a call from the principal that I wasn't in school. She knew exactly where to find me. And there I was, a six-year-old little runt, licking envelopes for Hubert Humphrey. I do not come from a political family whatsoever. Uh, I think it's a flip of a coin whether my mom would know who the vice president of the United States was today. <laughs> she may not be missing much. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and um, absolutely nothing. And so this apple fell very far from the tree. And and so I was a scrawny little kid. I got beaten up every single day because I was gay. But mm. I remember students, other students, other kids accepting me when I won my school spelling bee, when I had other different achievements and sort of being the brilliant, nerdy little kid was my way to gaining popularity. Kids didn't resent me for it. I, I confess they, they admired me for it. And by the time I got to, to high school, it was preposterous that I was running for student body president because I was running against the star basketball player. And who was I, an obviously gay guy? I was not open, but you'd have to be really, really not the smartest person in the world to intuit that I was gay. Um, so who was I to run against the captain of the basketball team? That, um, that actually, I ran for secretary of my student government against him. I won by three votes. By I won by calling every student at his or her home and visiting every home and talking to the student's parents as to why I would make their child's life better and, wow. and why the parents should tell their kids to vote for me. And I won by three votes. And then when it was time to run for president of student body, I ran unopposed. That doesn't mean I was popular, but wow, was I respected. And I will tell you, it shaped me as an activist, uh, as an LGBTQ activist, um, 
most people would know me in two ways as a really warm, friendly, and informal guy, and as brutal and as tough as nails as you can get in fighting for equality. Take no prisoners. I'll wear anybody down. Anything goes. When you go low, I'll go lower. If my equality is at stake or any other, or any other community is at stake, I'm, I'm a fighter. I, I love Michelle Obama. If you're going low, I'm from New Jersey. I'm going Jersey on you. And um, <laughs> really, that's that's who I am. And uh, you you know, staying in the stratosphere and elegantly not punching back as hard. It's not a privilege all of us have if we come from a oppressed community. And so that's who I am. And uh, that's what's driven me my whole life. I'm not Mother Teresa, but I do live my life um, for social justice, sometimes a little bit over the top. Um, But it is the essence of who I am. Wow. Okay. So many questions just from that alone. Uh, You know, I want to talk first, uh, you know, uh, about being gay and coming out. And, uh, you know, I've asked a handful of people on our show who also have been gay. What is that experience like when you have to tell, you know, your family members? Um, What what is that first conversation with the parent like? Because, you know, as a straight person, obviously, that's really just, you know, so far out of my reality. And particularly in my culture, right? I mean, Indian people, (laughs) you just don't hear about a lot of gay Indian people, even though they exist. And I I still think it was hilarious. Russell Peters is like, we could use some gay people in India. We have a population control problem there. Well, I know gay Indian people because I've dated most of them in New York. (laughs) (laughs) Let, Let me say this. There's a heck of a lot of similarities between visiting an Indian family and a Jewish family. Yeah, so I hear. Um, Cross-examination, extremely blunt. What are your intentions? Where do you go to school? Do you have good parents? I I swear to you, it's it's the same thing. So I I, I got a real kick out of it. Listen, I'm going to get personal for a moment, if I may. My coming out story was a little different for most people. So I had a, I wouldn't call it a burden, but I had a big challenge to deal with. My parents have two kids, me and my brother. My brother has profound autism. I hate to measure anybody with an IQ, but his IQ is 35. So he's not Rain Man. Remember the movie Rain Man with Dustin Hoffman, a high functioning autistic person? He's profoundly disabled. And until I came out at age 27, which seems so old today, I'm, I'm 58. I lived my life with a guilty burden that once I came out, my parents would have two children different from society's norm and that I would devastate them. The fact of the matter is I was right. My relationship with my parents was never the same after. My dad died in 2014, banned me from his funeral because I'm gay. Wow. And my mom struggles with it still. And you're talking about your stereotypical lefty social justice Jewish Democrats from New York City. You're not talking about some people who are born again from a red state. Mm. It's just that it was a lot for them to handle. Um, and it did take a lot of bravery. And I've been involved in civil rights my whole act, my whole life. Coming out to them under these circumstances in 1990 was the bravest thing I ever did or will ever do. Um, So it was very hard. And um, I am a person of faith. I'm a um, lefty guy who's now in rabbinical school at age 58. Um, If I have dreams and I've had lots in my life, I tend to pursue them um, and let nothing hold me back. I wanted to be a rabbi since I was age seven. Um, a very lefty rabbi who does not believe that the Bible is the word of God and meant to be interpreted literally, who sees its its sexism, homophobia, racism, all that stuff. Um, but I'm, I'm a person of faith, and I wrote a letter to my parents coming out in 1990. I emailed it to them. I'm rather, I'm sorry, we didn't even have email then. <laughs> or it wasn't that common. <laughs> I federal expressed it to them. And I went to synagogue the next day and I prayed for them to have strength, not for me to have strength. Um, And it wasn't easy and it was every bit as bad as I thought it would be. 
trust me, it, they took it hard and they never took it better. My mother's taking it a little better. But no, it's not that it was a movie where it was all embracing. No, I can't tell you that. Yeah. For me, Sweeney, I have uh, held on to anger that I still have toward them. And I converted it into becoming a gay rights activist. And I've often said that the best revenge for a troubled life is to create a newer world so others don't suffer what we did. Wow. So I have tended not to follow the cliche of forgive and forget. I don't want anything to consume me. I mean, I'm a self-actualized guy who lives my own life, who doesn't dote on my parents' reaction. But I have been able to convert the anger into progress for society, for LGBTQ people and, and other oppressed peoples and battles I have fought. And bizarrely, I'm not sure if I would have been as successful in those battles if I didn't live a hard life of rejection by my parents. Yeah. Wow. So can I ask you, you know, as a straight person, yeah. uh, what do you think people like me misunderstand about what it means to be gay? And, and let me give you some context and a potentially embarrassing and, you know, incriminating story. You know, I, I went to Berkeley, which is about as liberal of a college as you could go to. And right. I went there with this idea that I was this incredibly open minded, you know, incredibly tolerant person that, you know, could get along with anybody. And I remember for the first three, four, five weeks of school, uh, I was becoming very close friends with somebody. And, I, you know, it does go, you know, I, I wouldn't be bothered um, if a, a close friend, you know, told me that he was gay. Right. And, you know, and then he came out he, like and he told me and it it was it was so strange because like. I wasn't able to continue the friendship. And I, I, I look at that as, as a moment of, wow, that's not something I'm proud of. But it also made me aware of the fact that, wow, I'm not as tolerant as I thought I was, you know, like, and granted, I, like I mentioned to you, I've talked to plenty of gay people here on the show. And that's why I'm trying to understand, like, what do you think somebody like me, in particularly in a moment like that, misunderstood about somebody like you? The question is complicated, because there's a very big generational divide. I don't know. May I ask how old you are? I'm 58. I don't know. How I'm old. 42. Okay. So you're sort of on the cusp. By the way, if I had your beautiful speaking voice, do you know how much psychotherapy I could have avoided in my life? <laughs> I mean, you have this. Well, why do you think I do this show? It's my psychotherapy. Oh my God. You have this beautiful, mellifluous voice, and I sound like the gay Jewish Taco Bell dog. Um, so. Like, rawr, rawr, rawr. I wish I, I, I've tried. I should say, Srini, I've tried. If we have a chance, I'll tell you the story when I try to change my voice to be on air. And it's quite a funny story. Here's the deal. It's very different understanding LGBTQ people my age than people who are young LGBTQ people now. People my age, many of us are damaged. And when I say damaged, I don't mean damaged because we're gay, lesbian, gay, bisexual, et cetera, transgender. We're damaged because we have gone through hell, through rejection from society and from our families. That largely, it, listen, it exists today. It exists today in redder states in the country. I'm not saying that all is perfect, but it's nowhere of the magnitude from where I grew up. And I, I have been in talk psychotherapy since age 10 and I'm damaged from being gay, not because I am gay, but I'm damaged from society's reaction to me from when I was growing up and my parents' reaction to me. It was horrible. I felt like I had no home, like I was homeless. And I had to learn to become a self-actualized person I had to learn to become not angry. I could have been a very angry person. Um, I get angry in political battles, deeply angry, and, and you'll feel my wrath and fury. But in everyday life, I can't live like that. And so I can only speak, Sweeney, on behalf of my cohorts, LGBTQ baby boomers. We're fucked up because society made us fucked up. 
not because being gay is fucked up. It's the most beautiful thing, and I have great pride in it. But I can't tell you how how damaged we are from society's oppression and rejection from us. Wow. Um, thank you. <laughs> that was really profound. Um, so let's go back to this whole idea of popularity in high school in particular. It's funny, um, Mitch Princeton just wrote a book called Popular, which is all about, you know, what makes people popular. And it's funny because I have your book and his and, and both of these are, are, you know, basically my research for this post I'm writing about the psychology of audience building. I wasn't popular in high school, but uh, it, what I wonder, particularly because I've been writing about the need for approval and, and how it's so toxic for us, and yet it's so prevalent, particularly at a place like high school. So I guess, you know, the question that comes from that, as somebody who was the student body president of a high school who beat out, you know, an athlete, how do you balance that need for validation that I think we all have to some degree with internal self-worth? I'm still learning it. I told you I'm 58. I've been in therapy since I was age 10. I'm still learning it. And truth be told, um, we won marriage equality in New Jersey in 2013. Uh, I ran, I founded the state's gay rights group, Born State Equality, to win marriage equality. We won it in 2013. I then stepped down because I said, listen, there will always be LGBTQ causes, but it's a natural time to step down. We've won marriage equality. And I didn't hear the adulation from my own community and from from others who are rooting me on. The battle was over, and it's been tough. And that's a huge admission. I had to I had to get used to a much lower key life. I think I got involved in politics and in activism, and in, I, I got involved in public policy as a congressional staffer, um, in part to find new families with common interest, um, to be able to express myself and to achieve good and to do good. And I miss it. And and unfortunately, I'm not sure it's healthy to so associate self-esteem with one's work. Um, and that's an honest answer. I'm a work in progress on that regard. I, I think we all are. Um, I think that's a lifelong journey for each and every one of us. So, let's talk about what actually led to the turn on, because like I said, this is one of those books that I couldn't put down. And I thought this is, this is pure gold for anybody who is in the public eye. And uh, like I was saying before we hit record, you addressed nuances, all of which we'll get into, but it, what actually led to this? Like how in the world did you discover this of all the things yeah. you could write about? Sweeney, it was so interesting that you asked because when I told people that I'm writing a book and I told them it was about the likability of human beings, particularly those in the public eye. People scratch their heads. I'm a political animal who's worked in TV, uh, who's worked in politics. So they expected me to write a book about presidency, political science. And people said to me, what? Where, where is that coming from, Stephen? What? You're writing a book on likability in a psychology-oriented book? We don't get it at all. Like, that seems like a very odd pairing. Here's how my book started. I was a, I, I went to too much school in my life. I went to, to a, a public policy grad school at the Kennedy School up at Harvard. And then I went to law and journalism school at the same time at Columbia. And so I was trained to do many different things that I've all done. And when I, when I graduated from law and journalism school at Columbia, I decided to go into TV. And lo and behold, a couple of years into TV, I found myself being a producer at the Oprah Winfrey Show in Chicago. She's about five or six producers. Um, so I produced basically one full show a week. Um, and each producer produced about one show a week. And I began to notice what made good talk show guests. And I began to notice which kinds of guests got good ratings at home. I'm not the most quantitative guy. But I certainly wanted to develop a system. Listen, I was competitive. I wanted my shows to be rated highly, probably for Oprah's approval. <laughs> Ratings meant a lot to her, as they mean to every single person in television or radio or broadcasting. And I started to take notes on what made guests appealing to the audience. 
as measured by ratings or by feedback, such as through our mail. And I started writing down traits, different likability traits of guests. And I came up with about 25 to 30 traits while I was at Oprah. Okay. Um, I had done the same thing when I worked in Congress. Now, let me set the stage. It was 1993. I was a staff member for the U.S. House Judiciary Committee. I was a lawyer working for the House Judiciary Committee, drafting legislation. The chairman, the sub-chairman of the committee whom I worked for was Chuck Schumer, now a Senate Democratic leader, hopefully Senate Majority Leader soon. And when I worked for Chuck, I was taking notes on what made witnesses before our committee effective and likable. That was in 93. So I had a list of about 30 traits then. I believe I was going to lose my job when I worked for Chuck. I loved being a staffer on the Hill, and I loved being a committee staffer where you, where you have so much power. But I had a feeling the Democrats were going to lose the House in 1994. And if the Democrats lost the House, I would lose my job of no reflection to me that they just fire a bunch of Democrats. And indeed, uh, Newt Gingrich, the Republican, became speaker in 1994. So I jumped before I was going to lose my job, which I would have. And so I went from a Friday, my last day working for the U.S. Congress was on a Friday. On Sunday, it wasn't even Monday, two days later, I was in, I was in Indiana on Oprah's farm as her new producer. That was quite a switch, left brain, right brain. I don't know many people who would go from a Friday to a Sunday from a lawyer for the U.S. Congress to a producer on the Oprah Winfrey Show. One of the oddest job switches ever, but not to me. To me, it was a matter of finding people who were likable. So just as I found people who were likable working for Chuck with Oprah, I took notice of who were, were likable witnesses. It turned out to be the same categories, of likability, the same traits. I whittled them down to eight traits over the years with different sub traits. And as early as then, 1994, I said, you know, this would be a good book someday. And lo and behold, from 1994 to last, late last year, I had thought of writing a book. So the book really was in the works for 25 years. And um, I kept notes for 25 years. Uh, the book itself was very quick for me to write. It was. It took me like three months to write the book because I basically had 25 years of thoughts pouring out of my head. And so that's how that's how the book happened. Um, uh, 25 years in progress. Yeah. Well, let's get into the book. I mean, I like I said, to me, there were so many nuances to this book that you addressed. Uh, but, let, you know, at the very beginning of the book, you you say that likability grants the likable among us a certain degree of clout and influence. People listen to them. They follow their lead. Likable public figures tend to sell more tickets, garner more votes, build better relationships with their employees. Likeability affects what we do, whether we're aware of, not, aware of it or not. And likability is leverage. And you also said it isn't just something you have or don't. It can be manufactured and it can be destroyed. And I think the idea that it can be manufactured is something that flies in the face of so much conventional wisdom. So, you know, you know, there, there play a lot here, but let, let's look at this in the context of something that's relatable to our listeners. Why is it, you know, from your perspective that somebody manages to build an, a wildly you know, popular audience for a book or a blog or some creative work and other people don't? Because I think that to me, this book was the had a lot of answers to that very question. Great question. Part of it is about the person being likable in the moment that the American people are looking for a certain type of likability that matches that person. For example, America wants a person likable in the way Joe Biden is likable right now. Joe Biden is the person for this moment in politics. Do I believe that Joe Biden would be perceived to be as likable if he were running against somebody other than Donald Trump? Listen, he's very likable. I've worked with him, but I don't think that would be the perception of him. Donald Trump has brought his own likability down by being president chaos. <laughs> and 
America is looking for a likable antidote to President Chaos that happens to be Donald Trump. The definition of likability, and, and, and almost Joe Biden is the exception, because Joe Biden, I don't want to say he's rather generic, but you wouldn't call him an edgy, spicy guy. Certainly nobody in their right mind could call him an edgy, spicy guy. Joe Biden is the exception to the rule of how likability has evolved in our society. And, and let me tell you the story, Sweeney. When I was in journalism school in the late 1980s at Columbia, I majored, specialized in television journalism at Columbia. And um, bluntly, my professors, and they were not at all prejudiced against gay people. They were the most pro-LGBT people imaginable. I was not open, but they found every euphemistic way to tell me, if you're going to make it on TV, you got to sound less gay, less Jewish, less New York. You're never going to make it. And even as late as 1988, when I graduated from journalism school, your template for likability was Ted Baxter. I don't know if I'm, I'm probably aging myself as a boomer, but Ted Baxter was the generic anchorman from WJM TV and the Mary Tyler Moore show in the early 70s. In more modern terms, if any of you remember Will Farrell from Anchorman, yeah. that was him. Likeability was this deep, quasi butch slightly bumbling person, the voice of authority. Well, um, I was told I would never get on air if I did that. And so I took speaking lessons to sound like that. Um, and so for about a year, Srini, I actually spoke like this, the most stilted voice with an accent minimalized and an intonation that was phony and that went down like this. Like, like nobody talks like that, right? But that's what <laughs> I was. That's, but that's what I was told was good. And if, as, as an inside joke, if you listen to my voicemail outgoing message, I still talk like that. Hello, this is Stephen. So glad you called. And um, I don't talk like that, right? And but that's what people were looking for. Likeability has changed with the complete explosion in the number of media outlets we have. We have podcasts. We have. 500 cable channels. We have many networks right now. To break through, you sort of need to be a little different and a little edgy. So now, whenever somebody wants to book me, I hear versions of, and you're really going to be Stephen, right? Which means, and you're really going to come across as a loud gay Jew lefty, right? Like, you're really, <laughs> like you're really not going to hide it anymore, right? And like, as if I ever hit it. But except for this year that I tried and I deliver and they're happy, that wouldn't have been because we got to break through when people are switching channels. I don't exactly sound like everybody else. Poor country. So I'm different. Everybody has to be different now. To It's a good thing. I think now to be different is to be liked. And listen, Donald Trump was different. He was different <laughs> yeah. in, in 2016. I despise him personally and everything he stands for. But if you're asking me why, why I understood his appeal into 20, in 2016, I did. But he's jumped the shark. Um, people are tired of him and they want to change the channel. And people tend to, in elections, they change the channel from one kind of likability to another when they find the old kind of likability no longer so likable. So that is politics is why we go from vast shifts in personality and styles. How do we go from Obama to Trump to likely Biden? The country hasn't gone right, left, right, left. Ridiculous. People want to change the channel. They want something more likable. It usually yeah. means the opposite of what they saw. I often call people's preferences for likability style very similar to having relationships I think we're track. Listen, I was in a relationship for 23 years till 2015. I very much seek an opposite of who I was with. And I could not be dating people who are more opposite. But I think that's America. They want somebody right now who's the opposite. I wish I could tell you that it was a rejection of Donald Trump's ideology that I think Joe Biden's going to going to win. No, it's yeah. a deep personal rejection of Donald Trump. People can't stand him. 
What if you could forget about vacuuming for months at a time and still keep your house clean without lifting a finger? Sounds like a futuristic dream that's too good to be true. Well, it's not, because that's exactly what the Roomba i7 Plus robot vacuum does. I've been using one for months, and as a person who was traumatized by my mom's incessant need to keep our house cleaner than Buckingham Palace while I was growing up, having a robot that does our vacuum is so cool I wonder how I ever lived without it. And the carpets where I live are so spotless that even my mother would be impressed. Powered by iRobot Genius, the Roomba i7 Plus robot vacuum is smarter than ever, learning where and when you normally clean and suggesting personalized schedules so you can focus on everything else. Plus, during allergy or pet shedding season, it can suggest extra cleanings to keep your house tidy year-round. The Roomba i7 Plus robot vacuum can clean specific messes for right when they happen, so if you're racing out the door and notice crumbs under the kitchen table, you can use the iRobot Home app or Google or Alexa voice assistant to tell your robot to immediately clean that spot and consider it done. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Let's pretend for a moment that you're about to launch a campaign. It tested well, your entire team is happy, everything is going according to plan, except for that one thought in the back of your head. How do I ensure the people I want to target will be in the mindset to receive my message? The answer, LinkedIn. Because when you market on LinkedIn, your message reaches people ready to do business. And that means your advertising campaign will work as hard as it can as soon as you launch it. Over 62 million decision makers are on LinkedIn, and they're thinking about their business. It's one of the many reasons more than 78% of B2B marketers rate LinkedIn as the most effective social media platform at helping their organization achieve specific objectives. For me, LinkedIn has been an opportunity to discover new books I want to read, connect with potential podcast guests, and even find potential opportunities for speaking engagements. LinkedIn can help you reach your short and long-term business goals. They offer tools for brand building and lead generation. Not only can you target and reach a professional audience down to their job title, company name, and location, but you can engage people you already know based on who's visited your site or who you've contacted in the past. You can even customize your campaign based on the action you want your customers to take and objectives you want to achieve. Doing business on LinkedIn, the world's largest professional network, can help you reach your marketing goals. Do business where business is done. Get a $100 advertising credit toward your first LinkedIn campaign. Visit linkedin.com slash creative. Again, that's linkedin.com slash creative. Terms and conditions apply. Yeah. No, I mean, I, it's, <clears throat> it's funny because, you know, I, I think to me, people, I always say, you know, the genius of Donald Trump is that he knew how to work the media. That was his like playbook, uh, which we'll get back to that in just a yeah. second. Um, so one of the things I want to ask you, you know, we're talking about likability. And I remember when uh, Michelle Obama's book came out in uh, 2018, it was November. And I remember it came out the week before Thanksgiving, my family and I were flying to India. And by the time we landed in Delhi, it was on every damn shelf, even in India. And I remember having this conversation with my dad. My dad's like, oh, yeah, of course it is because she's a former first lady. I said, no, it's because she's Michelle Obama. I don't think Hillary would have had that same reception from the public in writing a book. Why is that? Like, what is that like factor? You know, probably what you would call the it factor. Like, why does that happen? It's as we talked about, Srini, nobody is perfectly authentic in public life. Michelle Obama comes across and is indeed a little more authentic. She's a little more vulnerable. And full disclosure, I love Hillary Clinton. I was a delegate for her in 2008 and 2016. I'm not somebody who quite understands Hillary Clinton's unpopularity aside from sexism. If you're talking about Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama, who Yes, I also think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. She has made perfectly clear that running for office and being in an elected position in her own right is not for her. And that jibes with the internal sexism of many people in this country about having a woman in public office. Therefore, whatever Michelle Obama does is not seen as having an ulterior motive It's seen as authentic, and I think she actually comes across as more authentic, because she has no ulterior motive according to what she says and according to the minds of the American people. 
and as an ulterior motive of wanting to run for office is a bad thing for a woman. Michelle Obama is popular in the same way that Hillary Clinton was popular when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, not gunning for office. So Michelle Obama has has the advantage that Hillary Clinton has had but didn't have when she decided to run for office. I think Michelle Obama is incredibly likable. You're you're 100% right as Michelle Obama. Part of her likability is for swearing public office. That's so interesting. Yeah, because I I still remember you may have seen it when she did the interview with Kimmel. Um, I think it was her first media appearance during the tour. And I never forgot this moment because he introduced her. She came out on stage and it took almost two minutes for him to start the interview because he had to wait for the audience to stop applauding. And that moment always stayed with me as as one of those moments. But and and she did. She mentioned that she had no interest in, in running for office. And I think that's a, it's a really interesting, um, you know, context that I'd never thought about before. Yeah. She also uh, has a great sense of humor, by the way, like. Great. Yeah. And she's. She is so quick. Listen, I think Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama's brilliant. Hillary Clinton is the most brilliant policy wonk in the whole world. I have seen Hillary Clinton funny at moments. You wouldn't put funny, though, among your top three or five adjectives in describing Hillary Clinton to yourself, would you? I don't think you would put funny. I don't think so. No. Michelle Obama's hysterical, actually. (laughs) I think she's very funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's do this. Let's um, get into the traits and sort of deconstruct this. You know, you talk about this food chain of likability and the people behind all of it, who you call the trainer, the evaluator, and the presenter. And who are those people? What do they do? What are their roles? And, and you know, how can people in their own lives listening to this look for the people who can help, them, you know, who can be those people for them? Sure. There are actual media trainers out there. Uh, now, you may think that they're trainers just about public speaking and that they're trainers just to speak better in the media. And many are like that. But there's a lot of scientific research behind the people who train other people to become likable. Let me tell you about one of them that I spoke about in my book. I worked in TV uh, for many years as a producer, and there's a very famous consultant in television whose work I admire greatly. And his name was Frank Magid, and he actually passed away uh, a number of years ago. And Frank Magid was a sociologist in Iowa who began to study why on-air television talent is likable. And in turn, if they're likable, why their station or program ratings go up. And Frank Magid started to consult news stations across the country to tell them how to tweak their newscasts, to tell news presenters how they could present a little differently. And I never agreed with the criticism of Frank Magid, which was, oh, you're you're just anchormanning the news and making all news presenters seem so generic and you're all about style. No, Magid's point was he actually wanted style to get out of the way from being a nuisance so that people actually listened to the news. I thought his theory was terrific. And so anybody who worked in TV news, as I did in the 90s, or in television as a whole, knew who Magid was. He was called the news doctor, and people would hire him. Um, In fact, it was Frank Magid who came up with a show called, the idea for a show called Good Morning America, or at least if he didn't come up with it, he was one of the people behind it. Uh, he, fa- he thought that America needed a softer, more likable competitor to the Today Show in, in the 1970s. So he came up with this idea of an of a early morning show with a living room set, with uh, fires crackling, with a nice folksy anchor person like David Hartman. And over the years, Frank Magid would expand his practice. His company is called Magid. They're based in Minneapolis after so many years being based in Iowa, where he was a professor. And Magid started consulting with politicians. And he and and his company started consulting with with companies and all sorts of organizations. And so I knew of Magid from TV. And I actually, when I was a political campaign manager, brought my candidate there, a guy named John Corzine, who was running for U.S. Senate. And we won that race. And I brought him to Iowa to get some training from Magid. 
And so there is all this research on really what kind of outfits should you wear? Are you excited enough on air? Are you bo- are you too boring on air? Do you use words that are too big? Do you speak too short? Do you speak too long? Do you have good interaction with the other on-air talent? All of these very nuanced questions. And MAGID measures the likability they're in on all sorts of matrices with with both qualitative and quantitative research. And um, when I first met Maggot, they were uh, based in Iowa, where he had lived, worked, and taught. And it was this big, anonymous, non-signed building. It looked like it looked like a, a it looked like something really mysterious in a, a corporate office park. And it is where many famous people have gone to get likability training. And the company still exists and has offices all over. So that, I said, is the trainer. The evaluator is comes from an industry that gives quantitative numbers of likability to every single person in public life. Well, at least many of them. So I profile the company in my book, The Evaluator, um, And um, it's called the marketing arm in Dallas, TMA, they go by now. But uh, the marketing arm gives likability numbers, overall likability numbers, and numbers in different categories to four to 5,000 people in public life from all across public life. And they've got all this quantitative analysis. And it's kind of fun to see, to compare the likability of celebrities And for many years, Bill Cosby, during the 80s and 90s, had the highest likability numbers. Obviously, that fell through the floor, um, given his scandal. Um, Morgan Freeman always has high likability numbers. Betty White, hugely high likability numbers. Julia Louis-Dreyfus, the people we think are likable have very high likability numbers. And the evaluators actually, like like, uh, the marketing arm, TMA, they measure likability of public figures as often as weekly. So you can see the week-to-week improvement or or decline of somebody's likability. And it's a real science. So one, you have people training you to become more likable. And once you're trained, you're evaluated. And then you have the presenter, which is what I did, people like me, press secretaries and sports spin doctors and speech writers and others who take a trained and evaluated product and put them before the public eye. In a sense, every press secretary from Kaylee McEnany, the president's press secretary, I'm going to vomit, and others, they were all the presenters. They present the evaluated and trained product. Wow. It's funny <clears throat> talking to you about this. You know, I, I think about our own podcast guests, and this is something that's always struck me as odd. But I also have used it as a very clear filter. It's often the people that nobody has ever heard of that are our most popular guests, um, because you know they're like, "Yeah, hey, we've heard all this other stuff before from all these you know quote unquote celebrities." But when you get somebody who nobody has ever heard of, the question is like, "Shreen, where the hell do you find these people?" And it's always, well, I'm curious, and that's my only criteria for how I choose. Um, but I'm curious, like, from your perspective, why do you think that is? Like, why is it that people who nobody has ever heard of, who are not necessarily famous in the public eye, resonate so much? Because we're not as phony and packaged. It gets back to authenticity again. Listen, l- l- look, l- look at what I've revealed, frankly, in our podcast so far. Um, I talked in depth about being gay and how having a differently able brother affected that, how my parents rejected me. I didn't come up with a, a beautiful rags to riches story. I didn't tell you it was all okay and beautiful and let's all applaud and feel good. Um, and public figures, people more public than me, are afraid. And you know what? Sweeney, I don't blame them. Um, and listen, I'm not. I'm not asking for people to uh, feel badly for celebrities, 
but they do pay a big price for their celebrity. Listen, and it sounds ridiculous. Everybody would love to have their money. We would all love to have the problem of being too known and living wealthy. I get it. But it is hard. And the times in my life where I've been more public than others, um, I ran an organization called the Anne Frank Center, where I was very public in, in President Trump's first year. I went after him brutally, far more than any other grassroots leader did, frankly. And I wasn't very public then. I found it brutal. I found being public actually brutal. So public figures are so cautious, much more than those of us behind the scenes are, much more. And so we make better guess if you're less cautious. Like, I, I, honestly, <laughs> honestly, it's not. I don't. I don't speak. I'm not speaking to you now with a publicist, an agent, and a manager in a room or on monitor virtually, like watching every word I say with bated breath and giving me notes. No, I'm not. It's just me, and um, I'm not. I don't have this safety net in my mind of. No, it's me. Whatever I say, it's good. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, that's why book publishers hate my guts, because I make their lives incredibly difficult. I'm like, thanks for sending the questions. I'm not going to ask any of them. By the, um, way, by the way, book publicists, having written a book, we have a word in Yiddish. It's called garnished, which means not much. I mean, yeah. honestly, I think that they're so generic and they're, they, they almost don't read every book in depth. They have, they have like five different pitches, but go ahead. Yeah. Like five. Different yeah. I mean, they, well, I know because they send galley letters, you know, like I get hundreds of them every week and I'm just like, okay, this is not a pitch. You're not telling me why they would be a guest, guest for our show, but let, let, you know, let's go into the traits. Um, we're going to do this, you know, sort of out of order, but we're already talking about authenticity. I think you made a really interesting observation uh, about authenticity. You said no public figure has ever or will ever present him or herself to the public with the kind of authenticity that reflects how 330 million Americans understood the concept except, of course, children at the early stages of development, it's structurally impossible for public figures to be authentic in public life as we understand authenticity to be in real life. Even when public figures want to show us the real versions of themselves, they face immovable obstacles. And I, I think that may have been probably one of my favorite lines from the book because of the fact that you addressed a very, very clear nuance about authenticity that I think people confuse with being a train wreck. Um, like. You know, and I've said this before, I say things to my roommates and to friends on a daily basis that would be a public relations crisis in the making, things that are completely inappropriate, things that I would never say on air on this show. Right. Um, and I, I think yes, the, the, exactly, Sweeney. Do you think people wanted Jeffrey Tubin to authentically do what he did? <laughs> no, I'm serious. No. Like, right, exactly. Like, so I remember, like, I, I admire the guy so much. He's brilliant. He's insightful. I actually felt bad for him. Call me a hypocrite, but I'm, I suppose if he were a right winger preaching against masturbation, um, I'd be giggling. I felt a little bad for him, and I've tried to restrain from pouring on. Um, I don't think that what he did has zero precedent in the history of humanity. Meaning, I don't think it's the wisest thing, in case all of you are wondering – no, I've personally never masturbated to porn while I'm at a work or a school meeting. I, I would highly recommend against it. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I have to tell you. Yeah. I, 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 would, I would find it hard to believe that a lot of people who are not tuned out, especially in the quarantine Zoom world, Many people masturbate because they're bored out of their minds from being on Zoom all day. I'm not, I'm not recommending this, but I do fail to see his crime, and nor do I think it was mentally disturbed, and nor do I think he has personal issues. I think people yeah. want to grow the hell up. I think it was completely ill-advised because – who would want to do that to take the – I wouldn't want to take the chance of that. Yeah. Like, please, I wouldn't want to take the risk. But no, I think sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, and Sigmund and Anna Freud have their limits. And no, I don't think he was looking to be found out. Listen, the quarantine is driving us all crazy. Uh, the guy was bored slash horny. Something, uh, something unfortunate happened. It's not like he did it on purpose like a flasher. But nobody wants that authenticity. That is the ultimate of authentic, if ever I heard it. 
he should have been a little faux authentic. He could be a little less authentic. I'm just suggesting, hey, Jeff, a little less authenticity. You know, I think, the you know, you talk about uh, authenticity, one of the subtraits being self-disclosure. You said self-disclosure, a rather careful self-disclosure uh, to come across as, as you know, real to the rest of us. And, you know, the place I learned this lesson uh, was from a mentor that I worked with for about two years, and it was on the tail end of a bad breakup. And I was more or less airing my dirty laundry on Facebook, basically using my audience as a therapist. And I was I was in a bad place. I was in a lot of pain. I was, you know, really depressed and, and just really heartbroken. And I remember he called me up and we had this lengthy chat, you know, and it was after we had hosted an event for like 60 of our listeners. And I told him, I was like, yeah, Greg, but I'm human too. And you know what he told me? He said, yeah, Srini, but you don't get to make that excuse because of the position you've put yourself in. Yes. That was tough to hear. And you know what? He was damn, up, you know, he was right on, you know, because now, you know, five years later with publishers, you know, investors, I realized what he was doing was preparing me for higher stakes situations in which those kinds of things could not get in the way of my ability to do what I do because they would be the undoing of my career. Srini is true. And Joan Rivers, the late Joan Rivers, who loved being in the public eye, she said, um, that she was very sick and tired of other celebrities complaining they have uh, no privacy. If, as I said, I'm a little more charitable than than she. She said, "If you're if you're a public figure, you lose your privacy the second you walk out of your doorway to pick up something at the Seven Eleven." And she said, "You have no expectation. You should have no expectation. It's the price you pay. And if not, don't don't act. Don't be a musician." Like this, this comes with the territory. Um, and she said it's why she was, she made sure she was jubilantly happy. And she said she really was to sign any autograph. Anybody who stopped her, she stopped. Um, but she knew at the same time, and, and, and as revealing as she was about her husband committing suicide, I'm sure it was crafted. I'm sure there, meaning not that she was phony. I'm sure there were things she didn't tell us as, as seemingly authentic as she was. And nor should she have. By being so open about some parts of her life, she managed to uh, maintain a zone of privacy. Listen, when I have a theory about Facebook, about social media, and why it's not authentic, I believe that the more people post about their relationships, the more trouble their relationships are in. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, there's nothing scientific about that. It has nothing even to do with my book. But I can't tell you how many times I have Facebook friends, people I actually don't know really well at all. And there are periods where they are, they are so over the top in the love they express for their partner or spouse. And months later, they're broken up. It's a very yeah. odd phenomenon. So... um there's a pendulum uh, and, a, and a room for, for authenticity. I'm not saying that it's good to be that inauthentic, but um, you, you, your, your mentor gave you the right advice. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the other traits. Um, you talk about the gateway traits, captivation and hope. And you said if public figures don't provide captivation and hope, forget it. There's no way you'll like them because you don't even know they exist. And I, I thought about captivation from the standpoint of my my own career. And I, I honestly have always felt there was this one layer on top of everything that I did that added captivation. It was the fact that I was a surfer because Indian people, like literally... In 10 years of surfing, I've seen three in the water here in the United States. And even in India, in a country of a billion people, there were only 300. Uh, but beyond that, like, what is it that captivates us and creates what you call that it factor for certain people? Look, here's what captivating is. Captivation is the ability not to be boring. Here's what I say. I, listen, Sweeney, I'm not going to put you on the spot. I don't know if you're single right now or not. But yeah, I am. Okay, let me say this to you and the audience. When you go on a date, is there anything worse than having nothing to say than dead time? I don't know about you, but I have gone out with the most boorish, obnoxious, egotistical, over, over self-indulgent, nonstop talking people, right? I would much prefer that over somebody boring who has nothing to say. That's torture. <laughs> That's torture. That's torture. Yeah. That's torture. Because with the first kind, with the with the overbearing person I have nothing in common with, 
okay, it's it's not torture for me. And I bet it's not torture for most. It's not because after after you have a date with such a person, you immediately call up your best friends and you say, oh, my God, you can't believe this date I just had. It's a little better than saying I just spent 45 minutes with the most boring person in my life. Cap- captivating captivation means you have precisely 15 seconds to hold somebody else's interest. And all of us, I think when we go on dates and I, in my book, I talk about how we fall in like is how we fall in love. Meaning how we fall in like with public figures is sort of how we fall in love with somebody on a date. Don't you know right away if you're clicking, if there's chemistry, how long, let me ask you, how long does it take for you to say to yourself, there's chemistry here? A minute? Yeah. I, I can probably tell in the first 10 minutes. Yeah, first five 10 to minutes. 10 minutes. You, you're right. You, whatever it is, you don't need an entire hour, right? Um, I interviewed for my book um, a producer of uh, 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 an associate producer of some of Steven Spielberg's movies who said Steven Spielberg basically said you had fif- the first 15 minutes of a movie to totally suck someone in to captivate them or you were gone. So captivation really is about entertainment. And in fact, I, I in in an early draft of my book, I actually called the captivation trait entertainment trait. The problem is I thought people would would take that to mean you had to perform a song and dance to interest them, like actually play an instrument to entertain or something. No, but you better be a damn interesting person. If you're not interesting you can't capture anybody's attention to persuade them. And I talk about in my book, there are all different ways to become interesting. There are ways you could be, you could be warm, you could be erudite. I could spend an hour on how to be captivating, but you better have your, your own individual formula on how to interest other people. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you mentioned entertainment because that is almost always something I look for in every single person that I interview is there's something that I think will be entertaining about this story, uh, and w- which is often why I've said no to very, very well-known people because I'm like, eh, I don't think there's anything particularly entertaining about this. Um, and I, I always tell people who want to create podcasts, I'm like, you should remember audio is an entertainment medium first, information medium second. Uh, and I think a lot of people miss that, particularly in, in the world that I play in of like online businesses. Exactly. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, Sweeney, I was watching, I'm a pop culture guy, although I, I have a brain, I tend to like what everybody else likes. I, 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 even though I'm a far lefty, I tend to like a three minute piece more than a 30 minute piece on NPR with the exception of this distinguished podcast, of course. But I was watching the other day, I was watching Hoda and Kathy Lee. And or, or Hoda, I, I think Kathy Lee, it was a clip of Kathy Lee. It's Hoda and Jenna But now. But when, in, the, in the fourth hour of today, Hoda and Kathy Lee were once asked, who is their worst guest ever? And their worst guest ever, they both said it, was Frank Sinatra Jr., the son of the singer. And they showed a clip of what made him so bad. And he just sat there with his hands crossed. And his answers were relatively intelligent, but he was so dry. And he said, you know, I think, I think I've think i answered enough, or I don't like that question. And there were vast gaps of silence. And he was not captivating. And I had to change the channel. Um, mm-hmm. So you got to interest people first. And then I say, as I say in my book, you better do it optimistically or with hope. Because listen, captivation without optimism or without hope is Omarosa, the villain of a reality show. <laughs> if if you're yeah. if you're just captivating like a train wreck, but you're not doing it in an uplifting, hopeful way, that's why I put captivation hope together. That makes you negatively captivating. You don't want to be negatively captivating either. You don't want to be Omarosa. You don't want to be Donald Trump, who he is right now. He's negatively captivating. Like, 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 I never thought that, you know, I think all of us who are progressives, we have PTSD from 2016. I thought I would, I'm still a bit of a wreck, this, like, emotional wreck this week before, thinking the polls are wrong. But when I turn on the TV, (laughs) yeah, when I turn on the TV now and I, I hear Trump speak, he's so insane that he's a captivating negative train wreck. 
I'm less knots in my stomach than, wow, this man, even after four years, my mouth is dropping. My mouth is dropping. So um, you don't want to be a ne- you don't want to be negatively captivating. You want to captivate with hope. Those are the two traits in the first stage. Yeah. Well, let's talk about um, the what you call the uh, clincher traits, um, which are protectiveness and reliability. Yes. Uh, you know, I think you said a, a reliable persona follows through on promises and pronouncements, remains steadfast in times of chaos, and stays on message, the shifting winds notwithstanding. Uh, and, you know, it's funny because when I think about reliability, I think about, you know, how people consume media. Every time somebody asks me, you know, about starting a podcast or starting a blog, I always give them this example. I said, all right, look, media consumption is based on habit formation. All you have to do is look at something like Friends on NBC. If you basically know that Friends is going to be on every Thursday night for the next 10 years, you plan to stay home and watch Friends. Now, assume that the writers of Friends decided, you know what, we're just going to write episodes when we're inspired, then they would never create the habit within the audience. Now, that's how I came to understand reliability, but I know it goes beyond that. Yes, but let, let me say this about reliability because you bring up a point, particularly in, in fiction presentations such as uh, TV sitcoms and fiction movies. The public, although they want an actor to play a role and want to uh, find themselves deeply invested in that role, they still want to recognize the actor as the actor that they love. And there are certain actors who have certain acting patterns or tics that I can recognize anywhere. Some of them annoy me. Some of these tics don't. But let's take George Clooney, for example, somebody who I greatly admire. He's a hero of mine um, because of the extraordinary work that he does for progressive causes, as does um, his spouse, even more so, perhaps. I know that I'm going to get, when I watch George Clooney, I know that I'm going to get a certain sideways double-take glance from him that I remember he had in The Facts of Life and then St. Elsewhere. Two very, was it... Was it St. Elsewhere? What what show was he on? I think it was St. Elsewhere, the medical show. Um, oh, that was ER. ER. Uh, it was ER. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, da- I'm dating myself. Yeah, I used to watch That was his ER. breakout role. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, oh, yeah. You see, I'm dating myself. The breakout role. I used to watch uh, ER every Thursday night at 10. And yeah. uh, let's just say that the facts of life and um, e- ER were two very different roles. <laughs> Right. Uh, I don't know if you remember he was on the sitcom Facts of Life. And then, I do, actually. <laughs> yes, I had such I had such a crush on him when he was on the Facts of Life. Oh my God. <laughs> I, 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 I did I didn't know whether I, I had a crush on he or Blair Warner more, but I'm gay, so I chose George Clooney. So the deal is two different roles, but he had certain acting things about him, a sideways glance, a double take, and then it's then it it, it continued on to his movies. Jennifer Addiston has certain facial nods, facial expressions, certain she moves her head to the side. She has this funny double take curious look. Okay. It's in every role. Actors kind of can't help it. Probably the only actor, man or woman who doesn't carry through these ticks to every single role is Meryl Streep. She totally inhabits herself. I would also say um, Helen Mirren totally inhabits herself in a role. Um, and, and however, we get comfort as an audience in seeing George Clooney. No matter what role he plays, he's still George Clooney. We get comfort in that. We get comfort in seeing Jennifer Aniston, no matter what role she plays, in my view, and I love her, but she's Jennifer Aniston. And we yeah. need that reliability. It's comforting to us. We don't want to see Adam Sandler in a deeply, deeply <laughs> dramatic way. We don't want to see yeah. Adam Sandler in drama. It's it's not reliable. It's not comforting. And I, by the way, I like Jim Carrey. I don't think he works as Joe Biden. It's the most bizarre thing in the whole world. It's partly reliable. We're watching partly Jim Carrey and partly Jim Carrey stuck in something that he has no, no business to play. He's very not, he's reliably bad in the role. He's a misfit. 
So we need that reliability. We crave it. And we crave protectiveness as well. And let me tell you where these traits, you know, I want to talk about stages three and four in my book, where I talk about the last two stages of falling in life with a celebrity or falling in love with somebody. The, the, the third stage is protectiveness and reliability. The fourth stage is perceptiveness and compassion. These used to be Democratic versus Republican traits. Let me explain. For much of my life when I was growing up, the Republican traits were protectiveness and reliability. Those are the Republican parties and Republican candidates stock and trade. We looked to Ronald Reagan, not me because I'm a Democrat, but people in general looked to Ronald Reagan to protect America and be hard against the Russians, then the Soviets. And we looked uh, to the Republican Party to be reliably anti-communist and reliably less government. And the Republican Party has completely lost that advantage, particularly under Donald Trump. The Republican Party was reliably the Protect America Party. It is not that under any anymore. It is not that when, when Donald Trump has ruined our alliances. So, in fact, Trump has permanently ceded, well, I think for a very long time, the Republican Party's party of protecting America reliably when America now stands alone in the world. Democrats have always been the party of compassion and perceptiveness and let's help the poor and let's help the middle class. And a major turning point uh, as to the Republican Party's giving up its mantle of protectiveness and reliability actually was not under Donald Trump. It actually came in 2008 under John McCain. Now, there were many things to admire about John McCain. I don't know if your listeners remember, but John McCain ran the most erratic presidential campaign ever, other than Donald Trump. But when there was a financial crisis, John McCain said he was shutting down his campaign. He wouldn't debate. Then he changed his mind the day later. He also chose Sarah Palin. And in 2008, Don, uh, John McCain's campaign was like a bucking bronco. He was a risk taker, and boy, did it show. You had no drama Obama running against him, brand new to the national spotlight, but somebody steady, and you looked at Obama, and he may have been new to public life, but you said, that man is steady, that man is reliable. And compared to the bucking bronco that John McCain is, Obama is going to protect us. So I would argue that since 2008, the Republican Party has consistently given up the mantle of protectiveness and reliability. Wow. It's funny when you when we talk about reliability, particularly when you're mentioning actors in roles. Um, I don't know if you've, you've watched the TV show Friday Night Lights, uh, but by far probably my favorite show on television. And Kyle Chandler is the coach on yep. Friday Night Lights. And you come to see you know, coach Taylor as this person of, you know, you know, character, like so many of us, like, I think as guys like that, for many of us, that is kind of a role model of masculinity, um, that we all look up to. And, you know, we always say like, you know, dream woman is basically the wife that he's married to, at least me and my roommates do. But one thing that was really interesting was my roommate, uh, had actually never seen the movie. He actually watched the entire television show mm. before we sat down and watched the movie. And the look on a, the, just the, the, you know, cognitive dissonance to see Billy Bob Thornton playing the Kyle Chandler role was like, what the hell? Like it just, and even for me after, you know, years of, and I had seen the movie years before, but to see exactly, it was exactly what we talked about. It was like, wait a minute, this is not what we expected from the coach. Yep, exactly. I haven't seen the show, but you, you gave a, a perfect example. Indeed. Yeah. Well, let's talk about um, the conscience traits, uh, perceptiveness. You know, you say compassion is the willingness to act uh, on perspectiveness through perceptiveness through love, kindness, and active care. Together, perceptiveness and compassion shed light on a public figure's feelings for other human beings. Yes. I have to tell you, Srini, bringing it to the 2020 election, I think Donald Trump's greatest failing from 2016 to 2020 is his lack of perceptiveness. Donald Trump really had his pulse on the public's thinking. Donald Trump knew exactly how to play to the public in 2016. If Donald Trump were perceptive in 2020, here's what his image would have been, and here's, I mean, here's what his, his narrative would have been. He would have said, listen, folks, I screwed up in the beginning. I did. 
we had a pandemic the likes of which we've never seen before. I even part of me didn't want to believe it. This is unprecedented in a hundred years and with few precedents in, in, in modern history. I screwed up. I learned. And I'm going to put these lessons for you to, and build back. That's slightly different than what he's saying. What he's saying now is, I've done nothing wrong. Come on. That is so not perceptive, not just in terms of the reality, but in terms of what people are willing to hear. You know, the American people are fairly generous. The American people, any, any voting electorate, is generous to people who say, I screwed up. Yes, had he said, I screwed up, that might be in a commercial by, by Joe Biden. But had he said he screwed up and said it early on and looked into the camera, people would have found it refreshing. And there just would have been so many times Joe Biden could have said, I screwed up because, because people would have said, okay, Uncle Joe, he did screw up, but he admitted it months ago. Like, do you have anything new for us? Had Donald Trump said he screwed up in the beginning, the way he handled this this crisis, aside from being substantively better, wouldn't be the issue that he is, that it is. He's just so imperceptive about what the American people want to hear. And that's been his biggest problem. And when you're that imperceptive about what others are thinking – particularly when there's a pandemic that's killed 226,000 people, you, of course, come across as, as, as narcissistic and lack of com- and, and having no compassion. So that's the best example of perceptiveness I can give as it relates at least to public life today. Well, let's talk um, specifically about scandals. You, know, you say that likability is not invincible. It can be damaged by mistakes, bled by crises, and killed by enemies. In a matter of seconds, public figures can watch their carefully cultivated likability slip, then tumble, then crash and burn. And, you know, uh, the I think the other thing this made me think a lot about, as I mentioned to you, I was on this reality TV dating show, and, and the person that they matched me with um, it was, you know, portrayed fairly villainously. And I've had a very strong line of, I am not going to say anything um, about her. Even when people have like, you know, literally, I've probably got 100 tweets saying, oh, man, you dodged a bullet. And, you know, and then they say something nice about me. My only response was, that's really kind of you. I hope you check out the podcast. Um, because I realized it was like, if I go on the defensive, then I have something to defend, but I have nothing to defend here. Uh, May I ask, which show, which show was it, Sweeney? <laughs> it's called Indian Matchmaking. You know what? Wait, I've seen Indian Matchmaking. Are you on? Yeah, I'm in, Are you on all the episodes? I, I'm in the second episode. Okay. Can I say something about that show? I yeah, must, please. Yeah, so I'm a TV show. I'm a TV producer. I didn't find it interesting enough to be offended by it. Meaning, meaning I have friends, I have all of my South Asian friends. Um, they have very strong views on it. Their strong views are it's, oh my God, I relate to this. This is hysterical or this is just broad brush. Is it, is, is it, is it anywhere close to reality, by the way, that show? So here's what I can tell you. I mean, the people are like, okay, is this how it unfolded? I said, what you saw was what was recorded. I, you know, and this is something I've said in interview after interview. I was the beneficiary of some very good advice from multiple people in my life. Um, one was my cousin who is a media attorney. I remember sending him the release and he said, listen, he's like, it doesn't matter what this release says. He says, basically, they can make you look like a jackass in editing. Exactly. Your job is to give them zero ammo, which they can do that with. So I was very mindful of that. And then, you know, my cousin, who is like my other sister, when I told her about this hour and a half ride, hour long ride along with the matchmaker, she was like, do what you do best, interview her, don't answer her questions. And if she asks, give her broad generalizations. Um, and the funny thing is, like, people are like, wait a minute. One of my friends jokes, she's like, you're the one person on the show nobody seems to know a damn thing about despite the appearance. Yes, I would have given you the same advice. Yes. Um, yeah. um, no, I was saying, really, these are matchmakers? I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> like, like, That's all I want to say about that. But, yeah. um, you know, I, let me tell you a story. This reminds me. So 
there was a movie. I've been in a couple of movies, which is an odd thing, I know. Um, one was a documentary called Freeheld, F-R-E-E-H-E-L-D. There's a million reasons why it was called that. It's, it's the name of a town in New Jersey. And it was about my activism when I ran New Jersey's gay rights organization. Um, and the movie portrays me as some people in New Jersey considered me as the Harvey Milk of New Jersey, which believes, believe me, has no privileges. You don't even get a free parking spot at Garden State Mall. <laughs> it has no privilege. To be the Harvey Milk of New Jersey is, trust me, it's not like being the Harvey Milk of San Francisco. I have no ego here. I don't even know what the hell the Harvey Milk of New Jersey means. Like, yo, I have no idea, right? I mean, I don't even get a date with one of the closeted gay people from Jersey Shore. Now, fine. So this movie... This documentary comes out in which I'm a major character in 2015. For some bizarre reason, actually, it was a great documentary. It wins the Academy Award for Best Documentary in 2015. Total shock. And they decided to make it into a um, – it was – I'm sorry. The documentary was in 2007. In 2015, eight years later, they made it into a Hollywood movie in which Steve Carell plays me. And um, here's what I mean by um, what fiction does to people and their likability. Fictionalized programs or heavily edited programs, whether it is the fiction movie of Freeheld in which Steve Carell played me in 2015 or Indian matchmaking, which they heavily edit. It's not as if they invent a character out of nowhere that's nothing like you. They simply make you into a one-dimensional character. They take the, the most discernible trait you have, and they blow it all out of proportion at the expense of other traits you have that are part of you. So, Sweeney, if you, if you, I, I'm, I don't know you personally beyond this broadcast, but if you are a very contemplative person and you show them contemplative to Indian matchmaking, they would have made you into a brooding terror. All you would have done would be if you're contemplative, they exaggerate it. They find that trait. So reality shows and public presentations take one trait you have, just one, and they exaggerate it at the expense of all others because that's all they believe the audience can handle. And in this movie in 2015, I was a loud gay Jew on acid. I mean, <laughs> it was hard to believe. I was like the love child of Paul Lynn from the Hollywood Squares and the great rabbis of the Talmud. I had z – there was zero nuance to me. And Steve Carell played me as this, and he wasn't too happy when I was quoted after as saying I didn't even recognize myself. And so it was very interesting. So – they called me onto the set and Steve Carell was playing me and I was warned by the director and the producers, don't talk to him. Don't even give him eye contact unless he asks you a question. You know, one of these prima donna stories telling me that means I'm not, I'm not going to follow their advice. I mean, we're all human beings. We all put on our shoes at the same time. I'm not going to take that advice, but I was well behaved for five seconds when I went on the set and he starts playing me and I don't have a poker face. So clearly I'm looking like I'm going to throw up. The director yells, cut. Steve Carell comes, comes to me and says, am I not playing you right? And mischievous little me looking at the director and the producer says, am I supposed to answer him? And then Steve Carell says, yes, answer me, answer me. And I said to him, Steve, have you ever met a Jew before? And he said, what do you mean? I grew up in Concord, Mass. We had lots of Jews. I said, Steve, listen to me. You're so not playing me right. What he didn't understand was this, but he was so over the top about me. And listen, your audience could tell I'm not the least over the top person naturally that you've ever met. I mean, I've tried to be bland and boring. It doesn't really work. But for example, if the script would say, oi, right, oi, Steve Carell would say like, oi, like he was Don Corleone in The Godfather. Like, oi, Jacques, like I'm going to kill you, oi. And I said to him, Steve, when you see oi, a Jewish person says it like this, oi, you're killing me. What are you doing to me? Like with this profound sense of Jewish guilt, he couldn't get it. 
because it, 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 it had too much nuance. So I became this screaming lunatic throughout the movie. And that's what Hollywood does. It takes one trait that you have that's rooted in reality and it blows it up out of proportion. Conversely, listen, likability can be constructed, but it can't be constructed too far away from who you are. Like, um, I, I talk about this in my book, Richard Nixon, the most unlikable person ever to be president other than Donald Trump. Richard Nixon managed to make himself likable in the 1960s before he ran for president in 68, how he hired the producer of The Tonight Show to be his personal likability coach. He played piano on TV. Richard Nixon learned to, ta- learned to tell jokes. By 1968, he had softened his image. It couldn't last him in office. So a thesis of my book is, sure, you could make yourself more likable, but within bounds. Like, I can never make myself over as a likably Zen low key person. That's just not happening. So, yeah. wow. Well, I think that makes a really fitting and uh, beautiful note. What has been a really, really thought provoking question uh, conversation. So, I have one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews at yes. Unmistakable Creative. And of all people, I think I'm very curious to hear how you'll answer this, given your background. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Your question is, what do I think that makes somebody or something unmistakable? The willingness to go through life without a safety net. Wow. True authenticity. If you go through life without a safety net and you're willing to be vulnerable and and show your lack of invulnerability and put yourself out there, everybody will know who you are. Amazing. Um, well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story and your insights and your wisdom with the listeners. This has been one of my favorite conversations probably I've had in the last 10 years. Um, thank you. So eye opening. Trini, I'm here for you. Whatever you want to do or work on together, you name it. I'm here for you. I love doing your show. Uh, thank you so much. And you got it. Everybody listening. We will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person, because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. What if you could forget about vacuuming for months at a time and still keep your house clean without lifting a finger? Sounds like a futuristic dream that's too good to be true. Well, it's not, because that's exactly what the Roomba i7 Plus robot vacuum does. I've been using one for months, and as a person who was traumatized by my mom's incessant need to keep our house cleaner than Buckingham Palace while I was growing up, having a robot that does our vacuum is so cool, I wonder how I ever lived without it. And the carpets where I live are so spotless that even my mother would be impressed. Powered by iRobot Genius, the Roomba i7 Plus robot vacuum is smarter than ever, learning where and when you normally clean and suggesting personalized schedules so you can focus on everything else. Plus, during allergy or pet shedding season, it can suggest extra cleanings to keep your house tidy year-round. The Roomba i7 Plus robot vacuum can clean specific messes for right when they happen, so if you're racing out the door and notice crumbs under the kitchen table, you can use the iRobot Home app or Google or Alexa Voice Assistant to tell your robot to immediately clean that spot and consider it done. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable.